Thank you, and it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, when I was originally, uh, when I was invited, I was asked to speak in terms of what was called uh, two walled cities, uh, Jerusalem and, and uh, Johannesburg. And I thought that that was a very good way of, uh, good uh, metaphor to look at the issue of apartheid and the occupation. Um, but before I get into that, I want to preface it by actually speaking about some differences uh, between uh, Israeli-occupied Palestine and apartheid-era so uh, South Africa. In fact, uh, a very dramatic difference. Within a few months of um, my taking over as president of Trans-Africa Forum in January 2002, I received a call from none other than the Israeli embassy congratulating me on the appointment. Um, this came as a, an incredible shock. Uh, <laughs> said, do they know who I am? <laughs> but, but then uh, they went on to propose a meeting uh, with me to discuss a cultural program that the Israeli embassy uh, wished to jointly sponsor with Trans Africa Forum that focused on Ethiopian Jews. Um, the meeting never happened. Uh, they called me and, and someone got sick, and I guess they're still sick because the meeting was never uh, rearranged. But um, in any case, I, I concluded they probably did a little investigation and just said that the meeting, there wouldn't be much of a point to having the meeting. But I, I raise this for two reasons. One is that I never received a congratulatory call from any Arab embassy. And this is not an attack on Arabs, but it is, it is something that I've noticed the Israelis are phenomenal in terms of outreach. The South Africans, on the other hand, were not. Um, and I'll get, to, get into that in a second, but it's a very, very big difference. And, and so the approach of the Israelis really does contrast uh, remarkably by, uh, from the approach that the South African apartheid regime took towards the whole notion of developing allies and constituencies externally. The Israelis have always had an active outreach program. And uh, while they have consistently portrayed themselves to be victims, they have done so in a way that, um, ex uh, that, that seeks international uh, support. Interestingly, other settler states like uh, South Africa and Australia took a very, very different view when it came uh, to this matter and did not, by and large, seek uh, non-governmental constituencies. The South African apartheid regime obviously had a close alliance with the United States, but did not spend a lot of time trying to cultivate a relationship in the United States uh, with a very peculiar thing that happened in the late 80s, which we can talk about later. The logic of both Israel and apartheid era South Africa can be found in their common origins as settler states. In both cases, the settlers created myths semi-religious or explicitly religious, including that God had provided the land for them and that the land was unoccupied upon arrival. A very, very common theme in every settler state, whether it's the United States, uh, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, etc., Canada. In both cases, the settlers portrayed themselves to be victims uh, against natives who were described as semi-barbaric, or intolerant, and or intolerant. Uh, given the permanent state of siege, every settler state, aggression came to be described as a defensive act, an approach also in common uh, with the United States. For South Africa, incursions into Angola and Mozambique, uh, for example, or anywhere else, always against alleged terrorists were so justified. Uh, the, for the settler state, there is a zero-sum calculation when it comes to the natives. Uh, this does not necessarily mean that the natives necessarily must be annihilated, but it does mean that, their kid, that, the, set, that the natives can never be allowed to prevail. Um, in this context, one can look at Jerusalem and apartheid era Johannesburg as emblematic of settler strategy and the settler state as a whole. Uh, though there are significant differences, uh, between uh, Israel and apartheid era South Africa, the for example, the religious significance of Jerusalem, the settler approach in both cases with these cities shared much in common. 
In the case of Jerusalem, the entire city has been seized by the settlers who have no intention of sharing it with the Palestinians. Uh, the settler plan is one of driving out the Palestinians through a combination of intimidation and inconvenience, otherwise known as psychological warfare. Uh, that is the painful difficulties encountered by Palestinians living in occupied East Jerusalem. Johannesburg, however, was constructed to be for whites only. Blacks could enter the city during the days to work, but had to clear out at nightfall unless they had explicit permission to stay. Blacks lived in uh, what can only loosely be described as suburbs or townships, the most well-known being Soweto, which I did not realize until I went to South Africa for the first time in 1999, is an acronym for Southwest Township. It's not a name in and of itself. Um, security, as in occupied Palestine, uh, was ever present in Johannesburg and uh, Soweto. Blacks carried passes and travel was always limited. Johannesburg stood as the top of the line first world city, while townships like Soweto were third world and often quite marginal. The walls, in the case of, uh, of Johannesburg, were actually around Soweto and other townships as opposed to being around uh, Johannesburg itself. In fact, one of the remarkable things in going to Soweto is that there's only one road and gate in and out. Um, as apartheid crumbled, so too did much of Johannesburg. Whites uh, did, um, left the city in mass uh, and uh, sought, and they abandoned their often luxurious high-rises to squatters or general squalor. They retreated to their, near, um, their nearly always uh, heavily militarily guarded and gated communities. And there was a remarkable reversal that unfolded. Whites would be in the city by days, and then they would be in their communities by nights. But they would not stay in Johannesburg during the evening. The uh, apartheid plan was for the removal of blacks from the best of land. In this case, it followed the model that was established by the British in Ireland in the 1500s when they drove the Irish out of the best lands in the north and forced them south and settled the north with uh, Welsh, Scots, and uh, some poor English. It also follows what we see uh, had, that is unfolded in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and obviously in Israel. Yet each settler state has handled its indigenous population somewhat differently. In Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, there was an overt effort at extermination. Uh, case in point, there are no Tasmanians left on this planet. Uh, not only were the indigenous removed from the land, but they were removed from the living. In Ireland, South Africa, and to some extent Canada, the premium was placed on the removal of the natives from the land and their socio-political marginalization. In the case of Palestine, I'd argue a bit of both seems to be underway, though the emphasis seems to be on the removal from land. In both the occupied territories and apartheid era South Africa, the settler state wishes to make the situation so inhospitable that the indigenous people leave on their own. It combines violent coercion with what can be described as hassling, or what I said earlier, as psychological warfare. In the case of South Africa, the apartheid regime created those fictitious homelands like the Transkei and Siskei. These were actually large territories with limited resources um, and, and limited anything with the exception of certain places like Sun City. The key land always remained in the hands of the whites. The occupied territories are replicating this pattern. And just as the apartheid regime presented itself to the world as visionary by liberating the homelands, so too do the Israelis when it comes to their vision of a Palestine state or statelet. 